Hi, it's Rob from The Bob Sphere, and today's video is going to be a well, completely spontaneous one. So I was looking at the Book Chemist's channel. I'll link him down, the Dropbox or whatever it's called. And he had a video about the books that shaped him, in the sense that made him a reader. So I said, well, let me try that. So we'll start. So. When I was young, I liked Dr. Seuss, and I graduated. Well, I liked Enid Blyton, but then she kind of lost her appeal very quickly. Then I went on to Roald Dahl. And then, what was the next step? And here I was really confused, because I was trying a lot of things, and I didn't like them. Then, for school, we had to study a book, and that was the turning point. And that book was... Adolf Huxley's Brave New World. You see, uh, literature has the tendency to explain things that are in your mind that you're not capable of um, realizing yet. This was it. I was a very angry 16-year-old or 15. Yeah, it was, I was 16. Angry 16-year-old. There were a lot of things about the world that were confusing. You know, uh, at the time there were there were the the tests on human cloning. I thought it was rather weird. And this book actually does talk about it. And this was written in the 1930s. And yeah, and it spoke to me. And then I found out there are lots of hidden references, which I really enjoyed finding out and discovering. Actually, my version has no... <laughs> something from... My version has... There's an old bookmark here. My version has notes, which helped. It's like that. So what is Brave New World about? It's a, well, it's a novel of ideas. If you can criticize it, and Edos Huxley as well um, said this, it's not really a story. It's really the inner message and how the world building is done. So this is a world where people are cloned according to their intelligence, and they're conditioned. There is, the, the world is sort of united, you can say that. And everything's synthetic and fake. Yet these people don't care. They're conditioned to like it. But there's a misfit. In every utopia, there's a misfit. Or misfit. Uh, dystopia, I should say. Every dystopia, there's a misfit. Called Bernard. And he wants something more. So he goes to an Indian reserve. And he sees, a, I wouldn't say a pure world, a different world. And he brings one of the native Indians back to his world. And this causes chaos. That's, well, there's much more than that, but that, that's a basic outline. And like I said, I, I loved picking it apart. I've read it so many times. I, I mean, I haven't picked it up since, when did I last read it? I last read it in 1998. 1998. I don't know what's happening. I'm slurring a bit. And, and um, is it, I like picking everything apart. I like seeing the symbolism. I like the inner messages. The characters, how they were feeling about this world. And then there's the, you know, the big reveal. It's a, For me, it was a huge turning point. And, you know, that's, I said, okay, that's what the type of books I like to read. And I went on. And then that developed to 1984. So I started going into um, dystopian fiction. So here's 1984. These are all my old copies from the 90s. Clockwork Orange, this I read when I was a little bit older. And there were some others. And then, the, you see, what happens in my reading life, it always goes up and down, up and down like that. So after I finished reading dystopias or got tired of them, I had to look for the next best thing. Then I was in the bookstore. We had some. We had a really good one. We have two good ones. We had two good ones in Malta. Now we have one good one. But anyway, I saw this. Now, every time I went into the bookstore, this bookstore was in Valletta, our capital city, this kept on staring out at me. And I kept on picking it up and putting it back in, picking it up, putting it back in. Until after two years, I said, damn it, I'm going to buy it. This is the book. In fact, it's not even, he's with Vintage, if I'm not mistaken, or Jonathan Cape now. This is the Mareva edition. And this is one of the earlier paperback ones from 1990. I got this in 96. 97. Wow. This, I mean, first it was in dialect. So I had to read it actually twice. So when I finished it, I read it again. But then 
second reading, everything started becoming clearer. So Train Spotting is a series of, you could say episodes, even vignettes, about heroin addicts, but it's also a criticism over about society, and the, that, that's where its strength lies, about people's attitudes, about struggling, and then balancing that with being an addict. And it was powerful stuff. And even to this day, Irvine Welsh is one of my favorite authors. He's not as good as he used to be, in my opinion. I think the last great one was Porno. And then there was a huge decline from then. But I still buy his books. I'm going to be reading one very soon, his latest. And that's, yeah. And that got me hooked on Irvine Welsh. And then Kurt Vonnegut was another, another big stepping stone. This is the first one I read by him, not Slaughterhouse Five, believe it or not, it was this one. And I think I'm glad I, this was my first Vonnegut because I'm not a huge fan of Slaughterhouse Five. I think this is a far superior novel. It's about an inventor who has this chip, and once he puts it into water, it turns it into ice. It's called Ice Nine. And then this sparks off a whole worldwide chase for this chip. That's yeah, brilliant. I mean, all the chapters are just, I think there's what, 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 100? Yeah, 127 chapters. They're all one paragraph long. It's written in the slang. It's really cool. It's a cool book. That's what I said. I said, wow, this is awesome. And lots of Vonnegut's books are like that. I think my favorite would be Galapagos. This would be my second favorite. Anyway, then after Vonnegut, and I kept on reading, I, I've read nearly everything. There are actually maybe two or three, which I haven't. I was in London, and, and I found this. Actually, I read a review about it on Uncut Magazine, saying how good it is. So I said, okay, it's about a dog. Let's try it out. I've never heard of Paul Oster before. Never, never, never. So this was on a complete whim. I got this. I loved it. Again, this is a criticism of America through the eyes of a dog. Sorry. And, wow, I mean, it, it just hits you. Again, that, that feeling of a book articulating something which you do not have the power to do. It did that. And now, actually, believe it or not, people consider this uh, his weakest novel, but Ice is still one of my favorites. He has written better ones, but still, this was my first, and that's that's always the special one. Another turning point. What a carve up. I've spoken about this book so many times, so many times, so I'm not going to get into it. But this changed the way I looked at literature completely. This is a book that manages to fuse in about 10 different genres and come out with something original and easy to read. That, that's genius. In fact, this is a book I am constantly recommending. Read this. It will change your life. Now, obviously, I read others like Salinger. And that was a game changer as well. I read Donna Tarsus' Secret History, another big game changer. But then there came this. This is my... Well, it's actually my third Murakami. But it's the one that made me like him. The first one I read was The Elephant Vanishes. And I thought those were kooky short stories. They were good. Then I read Sputnik Sweetheart, which I hated. And I still don't like it to this very day. But this was the third one. And that's it. I said, this guy's a genius. Two parallel narratives. And it's really done very well. And then there's that ending, which is quasi horror. It's, it's fantastic. And I read everything of his. And I, uh, yeah, I'm actually very good with Murakami. Not everything, again, I, this is his best one, in my opinion. Not everything he's written is great. But I would say the quality is quite high. If you've never read Murakami, you read this. Don't start with Norwegian Wood, because that's different from Murakami's other work. This is very typical of him. Usually people who read Norwegian Wood first are not, aren't able to get into Murakami's other works. Don't start with Norwegian Wood. Now, I mean, over the years, I've read other uh, milestones. Don DeLillo's Underworld, Cormac McCarthy's The Road. 
trying to think of um, more female authors. There's the Bell Jar. Uh, what else? Uh, Americana. But I, I think the big, big, big one, which sticks with me to this very day, and I only read two years ago. What was it a year ago? A year ago. Sorry. Is this. And I still think it's a, it's a very important book, and I think it's one of the greatest books of the last 20 years. This is Duck's Newburyport by Lucy Ellman. Another criticism of America. Again, expressing my inner feelings. This is all about Trump's America through the eyes of a housewife who has a rambling monologue. There's also another subplot that's written conventionally. It's about a lionhood. This is essentially, even though I said it's a book about America, which it is, it's also about motherhood. It's a very tender look at it. Once you read this book, it will not leave you. Of course, there are others. There are tons. I mean, each book is a memory. Each book is unforgettable. Ones that you like, obviously. But even if there's some you don't like, there are others you can, ret you can return to it, and maybe you'll change your opinion, as uh, quite a few have in my life. So, harder... Can you mention the books that made you a reader? Have you read any or any ah sorry, have you read any of these books? Your opinions on them? Tell me. And see you next week for another video.